So today we are continuing our this session on the Bhagavad Gita, and we are having the sixth session now. So in this session, so till now we have, we have discussing we have been discussing how in the Bhag the Bhagavad Gita's thought flow is going and how we are taking the concepts accordingly. So first we talked about the concept of dharma. Then we talked about the concept of identity. Then I talked about the results of understanding that identity, how the soul transmigrates, how we can see the departure of a loved one with a spiritual vision. And in the last section we discussed how this philosophical understanding of the Bhagavad Gita relates with today's conceptions of spirituality. Now today I'll talk about another question. Now going from spirituality specifically to the soul. So do today's question will be two main questions. We will be discussing do animals have souls and are humans just evolved animals? So we'll be discussing we are going also sequentially verse by verse based on the Gita. This is Gita 2.30. This is Dehi Nityam Avadhyoyam Dehe Sarvasya Bharata Tasmat Sarvani Bhutani Natvam Shochitam Arhasi So Krishna is speaking Dehe Sarvasya Bharata that the soul is present in all living beings. Dehi Nityam Avadhyoyam and that Dehi, that embodied soul, has two characteristics, he says. One is, it's Nityam, is eternal, and Avadhyo, is indestructible. And Tasmat Sarvani Bhutani. Therefore, O Arjuna, for all living beings, Natvam Shochitu Marhasi, do not lament their, uh, do not lament their demise. It's inevitable at the physical level, but at the spiritual level, the soul will always continue to exist. So, what we'll be discussing will be broadly these two same questions. Do animals have souls and are animals are humans just evolved animals? That's broadly. So I'll discuss first the conception of the soul as the first half. The second half will be about humans. What distinguishes human beings? So now first, how can we know if animals have souls? One basic symptom of the soul is the presence of consciousness. Wherever the soul is there, consciousness is present. And there have been many materialistic or reductionistic attempts to explain consciousness in physical terms, but none of them have been successful. And conscious, if we consider at a simple logical level, matter is ultimately made of atoms, molecules, or fundamental particles. None of them have consciousness. So just a combination of them won't produce consciousness. So Consciousness comes from a non-material source at the soul. That's a reasonable inference. And then wherever there is consciousness, we can infer there is the soul. So now how do we know whether consciousness is present? So <clears throat> broadly speaking, we can see it from the presence of emotions. There are many aspects to consciousness. Emotions is one key aspect that is more easily perceivable. Consciousness also has intentionality. We observe something and we, with a, with a conscious intention, decide to do something. Consciousness also has a capacity for higher level abstract thinking, not just sequential thinking, which even computers, machines can do. So, a symptom of the soul is the presence of consciousness. And animals also feel presence of pain. Animals feel joy or sorrow and perhaps. Uh, the animals which in which you can see it most of the animals that are closest to us. So in Indian culture, it could be the cow. In say Western in American culture, it could be a dog. And we can see that they also have emotions. So to say that they have consciousness is a very reasonable point to make. And now if you consider animals have consciousness, then that is one reasonable way to say that they they also have a soul now there is a school of thought called solipsism which claims that we can't at all know whether anyone else is conscious except we ourselves that everybody else could be just 
not just other animals but even other human beings could be programmed machines robots who are programmed in a such a way as to appear to be conscious at one level uh, it's a it's an absurd argument because we can sense we relate with people and we can sense their emotions we can sense their consciousness but at a absolute rigid scientific level consciousness itself is not quantifiable we can quantify brain waves but we can't quantify consciousness itself there sometimes with respect to abortion ethics the question comes up when does the embryo become conscious but strictly speaking from a scientific point of view science can't answer the question when the embryo becomes conscious literally in terms of consciousness because there is no way even the consciousness of the mother can be mentioned mentioned measured now we do talk about a person being unconscious at times and when we say that they are unconscious what we mean essentially is that they they are not responding to us they are not responding to physical stimuli and their brain waves are in a particular way so but these are essentially the results of consciousness so is there any objective parameter to for us by which we can infer the presence or the absence of consciousness we could have another facet of parameters and that would refer to looking at what is the result on the body if consciousness is present and essentially we see that there are <clears throat> normal body undergoes some changes whenever there is consciousness present and <clears throat> uh, a normal physical structure as contrasted with a uh, with a body that has having a living being within it there are essential some essential fundamental differences in which the body functions so a normal matter undergoes primarily three changes whereas matter that is you could you could use the word ensold undergoes six changes so i'm sharing the screen now to be able to see this so matter without consciousness basically goes through three phases creation deterioration and destruction say if we have we have created a build a house the building that's created then <clears throat> if it is not taken care of it deteriorates faster even if it is taken care of it deteriorates and eventually it is destroyed but matter with consciousness exhibits three more changes matter with consciousness that is that is after birth there is growth no matter how sophisticated a robot we make the robot itself doesn't undergo growth then not only growth there is maintenance now maintenance can be because of homeostasis no, no, maintenance can be because of clotting if uh, if say the limb of a chair is broken if a arm of a chair is broken it just stays cracked but if say our skin gets cut after some time the skin Uh, heals itself there's clotting immediately and there's healing gradually so the so this whenever the soul is present in a body that body has the capacity tendency to maintain itself so the soul as we have discussed earlier is eternal and wherever the soul is staying the soul tries to maintain that and continue existing over there so maintenance is another characteristic and one way the soul tries to continue its eternality is by reproduction if i can't live on then at least let my progeny live on so reproduction is also something which uh, no matter ma how sophisticated matter is it it can't do it so computers nowadays can do information processing much much faster than humans but we don't have computers uh, reproducing themselves and then the remaining two are similar there is birth there that's similar to creation there is aging which is similar to deterioration and there is death which is similar at a physical level to destruction so we can consider that consciousness is present it uh, that the soul is present wherever these three additional changes are happening 
uh, now they do happen in animals they happen even in plants they happen even in microbes and therefore we can reasonably conclude that there is a soul present in animals also so now that may raise a question <clears throat> why would the idea that souls are present only in humans come up at all if consciousness were the symptom then animals do have consciousness so this notion as i said the, there are certain terms which are used by all theistic traditions or all spiritual traditions for example the word soul might be used the word god might be used but the specific conception associated with the words may be different the term might be the same but the concept might be different so in the abrahamic religions the abrahamic religions judaism christianity and islam there are many differences uh, within them also but there are some overarching similarities and one similarity is with respect to broadly the conception of the soul so there are the idea is largely what can be called as anthropocentric anthropos is human centric of course is at the center so the idea is, especially in christianity is to some extent humans are placed at the center of the creation so jesus descends to deliver humanity and god made humans and then he felt the creation was complete and humans are the summit of creation so within their idea is that humans alone are special and can be delivered so i talked about how there might be the same term but different conception so the difference between humans and animals the the bhagavad gita's understanding is that is of a dig, is it's in degree but not in category whereas in the abraham in christianity especially from where the idea of the word soul also comes up and from there the idea the animals don't have soul comes up is that the difference between humans and animals is in category not in degree that animals don't have souls humans alone have souls and humans can attain uh, humans alone after being delivered can attain eternal life now there are some christianity is a very very uh, big religion and there are many many different theological conceptions so some christians may differentiate between the word spirit and soul and some of them may say that the animals have spirits but not souls now shri prabhupad when he wrote his bhagavad gita commentary he he wanted to be unambiguous and does he would use the word spirit soul the two are not separate so essentially animals the christian conception is that animals don't have souls or they don't at least have the kind of souls that we humans have they don't have the kind of souls that can attain eternal life so now why would they think like this because at one level there is a significant difference between humans and animals so this point of the difference between degree and category i will elaborate on this but let's try to get a sense of different conceptions of the soul now broadly speaking the christian conception is that the human souls are created at birth and then they live forever in heaven or hell so the idea is that with respect to the soul's existence there are two terms there is reincarnation which is the soul will come back again in another body as i mentioned last time karma is flesh to come again in another body and the corresponding term is for the past is pre existence so pre existence is for the past lives of the soul and reincarnation refers to the future life of the soul, lives of the soul and this whole process is called transmigration so now christians again i am talking about mainstream christianity there can be specific christian subsects which may have different ideologies but broadly their idea is when a man and a woman unite a soul is created and after creation the soul is eternal and that's why their definition of eternity is like semi infinity eternity is not no beginning and no end as the bhagavad gita says na jayate mriyate va kadachit there is no birth and there is no death there is no beginning and there is no end but their idea is there is a beginning but there is no end so from now onward to infinity to eternity to forever 
so it's semi infinity if you could say if we have infinity is like a the symbol so it's only this symbol and there is also the idea that the soul is not separable from the body and that's why if we consider that that's why there the there is the concept that has arisen from the conception of res resurrection many of jesus followers are said to have seen jesus in that same body after he was crucified and that is the idea that he was resurrected so resurrection and reincarnation reincarnation means to come again in flesh but in a different body resurrection means to come again in that same body so their idea is that the soul will be resurrected in the same body and now of course they also know that the body will be destroyed soon even if you put it in a coffin carefully but their idea is by god's arrangement that same body will be reunited that will be will be reconstructed or whatever and so there are these two differences and although the term is the same but that the soul is created and is internal thereafter and the soul uh, and the body are in some senses inseparable so again the point here is not to go into the specifics of christian theology but to just understand where the idea of the animals don't have soul come from comes from so now we'll see how there is a balance in extremes with respect to the gita's understanding so if we consider a pendulum the pendulum can move in two different extremes one extreme is the christian conception and the other extreme is the modern scientific or scientific evolutionary conception so the christian conception is humans alone have souls and we are entirely different from animals the evolutionary conception is that no living beings have souls we are just evolved animals we are all just physical creatures and yes humans exist at a higher level so between these two extreme conceptions that there is only humans have souls and nobody has souls uh, now what is the extreme that by this idea by the christian idea that humans alone are special and the the evolutionary idea is there is nothing special at all about humans we are just like animals we just more evolved that's all in between there is the balanced understanding which the gita gives that yes humans are special not because we have souls but because our soul is more evolved than animals so rather than saying so there is also a difference between humans have souls uh, or living beings have souls as contrasted with living beings are souls so we are we don't although sometimes just for convention say we might use the word soul in a uh, second person sense which is put your heart and soul in your service so put your soul when we use the word well we are the soul so how can we put our soul that is just non literal usage so put your here we said put your soul means put your spirit put your entire being into it so sometimes this word soul is used in a non non literal sense so for example we may say the soul of america was shattered when the twin towers fell so that is now it's not it's used as soul means the spirit of america was shattered so sometimes the word soul may you be used in a non literal sense but if we are using the soul in a literal sense which the bhagavad gita does primarily that the soul is literally a being that and the being exists different from the body then accurately if we want to speak we don't say we have souls we say we are souls and we have bodies although the non literal usage is not entirely wrong if it is used with a proper understanding of what we, why we are using it so if we say technically all living beings are souls so the speciality of human beings is not in category it's not that we have souls and others don't have souls but it's in degree that the souls in human beings are more evolved than in animals so now we have moved on to the second question by now the first question was do animals have souls the second question is are humans just evolved animals so now that human beings are different from animals is something which has struck thinkers throughout history and what exactly is the difference if we consider from the point of view of say uh, western intellectual history uh, aristotle 
propose that humans alone have the reasoning ability that humans alone actually seek knowledge and we consciously seek to increase our knowledge and that's how that's what differentiates us from animals there were descartes he took it further further and said we don't just seek knowledge but we have the reasoning faculty and we try to rationally understanding understand things mm -hmm. <clears throat> then further immanuel kant he said that we have free will and we have a moral sense we can sense this is right this is wrong and based on that we can choose animals simply work according to their instincts now all these observations are true that we do seek knowledge we try to get a rational understanding of things we do have a moral sense of what is right and wrong now, a, a tiger sees a a tiger sees a deer and if it's hungry it just pounces on it a tiger doesn't think about the ethics of meat eating or not eating meat that just it's biologically programmed say if it's ekadashi and if a cat sees a mouse the cat doesn't think oh today i have to fast no it's just there is no even consideration of impulse control for or any sense of right or wrong so we have free will and we have a moral sense and by which if required we can control our impulses so we are we are addressing the question are humans just evolved animals and i talked about what are what are the thoughts of different thinkers about differentiating between humans and animals now let's look at the broad vedic conception of this difference within which we can in the gita is also placed as a part of the vedic body of knowledge so this is a well known verse which comes in the mahabharat and it also comes at other places in the indian text so this is ahara nidra bhai maithunam cha samanya metat pashubhe naranam dharmo hi tesham adhiko vishesho dharme nahi nah pashubhi samanah so ahara nidra bhai maithun eating sleeping mating defending these are broadly speaking the activities that all human beings do from a biological perspective we might say that we all look for food we all, we all look for <clears throat> some place to rest we need shelter then we all are equipped to defend ourselves and <clears throat> in whatever ways according to our body and we all reproduce so this is from this is correlatable from biological perspective that all living beings do this but now dharmo hi tesham adhiko visheshu dharma is what differentiates humans from animals and if there is no dharma dharme nahi nah pashubhi samana that that we are just like animals if there is no dharma now what exactly do we mean by the word dharma we discussed this earlier uh, but we let's go back to it and see it in this context now, the word dharma is sometimes translated as religion now is it just religiosity that differentiates humans from animals now by religiosity what do we mean is it just religious rituals is it that we humans can do such rituals and animals can't but conceivably nowadays chimpanzees could be trained maybe to move a arthi plate in front of the deity the robot can be trained to, trained to do that would that be doing a religious activity then and would this differentiation no longer apply so actually we have to look at not the common meaning of the word dharma as religion but dharma as we have to go to its foundational etymological sense the word dharma comes from the word dhri is to sustain so dharma is that which sustains our existence that which helps us to live in harmony with our with the nature and purpose of our existence so that which enables us to live in harmony with our nature and our purpose so normally what do we mean by this see our existence is sustained when we live harmoniously if we are driving on the road and if we drive on the wrong side of the road we can't sustain that either the cops will pull us over or some other vehicle will hit us so if we have to sustain ourselves while we are driving we have to we have to drive properly we have to drive on the right side of the road and roads are meant for driving if somebody starts um, 
say doing a dance performance on the road unless they have special permission to do that again they will not be able to sustain it they'll be pulled outside or they'll be knocked down so when we are on the road the road is meant for a particular purpose and we need to live in we need to function in harmony with the nature and purpose of the road so similarly when we live in the cosmos we have to live in harmony with our nature and purpose so that activity sustains our existence that is dharma now, now dharma is we could say what sustains our existence metaphysical inquiry first to understand what is the nature of my life what is what is the nature of my existence why am i living and then followed by purposeful religious activity i'll explain what this means but so dharma does can refer to religious activity but it is not just ritualism it is done to raise one's consciousness but let's look at uh, let's look at what we mean by metaphysical inquiry so to differentiate between humans and animals now this is the vedic uh, this is the vedic or dharmic understanding and i talked earlier about the contemporary understanding or western understanding let's see if these two can be brought together if you see animals use their intelligence to fulfill their bodily drives humans also use their intelligence for that purpose we also think where i can go to get good food where i can sleep peacefully how can i find the best mate or uh, whatever but then we we also ask the question why we should fulfill our bodily drives and in fact why to live at all this why question is the womb of spiritual growth and based on this why question we have the capacity to delay physical gratification for higher realization now this this capacity to delay gratification for higher realization for higher understanding this is essential for progress in any area of life when newton saw the apple falling some people say it fell in front of him some people say it fell on him whichever way when it fell in front of him he could have just grab the apple and eaten it and gone his way but he asked the question what made this apple fall so that capacity to delay gratification for greater understanding for greater comprehension that is critical for in all the areas that we humans are differentiated from animals now there are many differentiations some thinkers say that what differentiates humans from animals is language now we have a sophisticated system of communication using language which as which is in language if we use it commonly but it's very complex and abstract now how certain sounds are associated with certain meanings which are also associated with certain visual marks it's it's a very complicated system and when uh, there is a attempt to give a reductionistic explanation of human origins how how origin evolved how language evolved is something which is which stymied thinkers for decades even the reduction scientists so language is also a, a example of something that differentiates humans from animals but language also demonstrates something else learning a language requires the capacity to delay graphic gratification for something higher a baby could just be eating food and playing but to learn language the baby has to put in a lot of effort parents have to put in a lot of effort parents and teachers to teach a language but when language is taught then there is a whole new universe that opens so this capacity to delay gratification is is defining for human beings we will discuss about this topic more in the third chapter when you talk about the concept of yagya or sacrifice but the key is dharma metaphysical inquiry followed by religious activity the the underlying universal principle here is that we can delay some pleasure in the present so that we can have a better future but that better future can be through gaining scientific knowledge that better future can be by learning language for communicating that better future can be by drawing an art 
which requires a lot of effort, but which will, which when done beautifully can give a lot of pleasure to a lot of people afterward. But underlying it all is this, this impulse control that is there, but what is its purpose? Why should we do it? We can do it, but why do we have the capacity to do it? That brings us to something deeper that actually, as I said, the why question is the womb of spiritual growth. The soul is always, uh, always attached to the body in any species. I earlier mentioned that the soul in the human body has the most evolved consciousness. Now, evolved consciousness, what does it mean? Is it again just an anthropocentric statement that we are, because we are humans, we think we humans are better than animals? No, it's not an anthropocentric statement. It's just an obvious reality that we humans are, if we consider physically, we stand nowhere near the animals. Either in size, there are lions and tigers and rhinos and elephants which are much bigger than us. In speed, so many animals are bigger than us. In uh, weapons, in, in given inside the body, with our nails or our teeth, we can hardly do anything. Whereas even birds have sharper nails than us. Cats have sharper nails than us. So physically, we are puny and powerless as compared to many, many other species in life in the, on the earth. But still, we rule the earth now. So there is clearly something that differentiates humans from animals. And we are trying to, so it's not a, just a ego, egocentric idea of human beings to say that we are better. But so what, if, so when we say human beings have more evolved consciousness, what does it mean in terms of the understanding of the soul? So we discussed various characteristics or symptoms that our consciousness is more evolved. We have seen the various products in human culture, language, art, science, which testify to our evolved consciousness. We can see the fact that we humans rule the earth. That is also, although we are physically deficient, that also testifies that there is some, that our consciousness is more evolved. But what does it mean in philosophical terms? The soul is, if you consider the soul is here, the body is here. Normally, whenever the soul is in a particular body, the soul gets attached to that body. And the soul identifies with that body and the soul functions as if it is the body. This identification is there in all species. And then the soul thinks that gratification of the body as per the body's impulses is the way to pleasure. I repeat this point because this is very important that not only when we, we identify with the body, then what it means is not just I say I am the body, but how does we know if I'm identifying with the body or I'm not identifying with the body? It is, the key is, do we consider the body's definitions of pleasure as our definitions of pleasure? So if we consider eating, sleeping, mating, defending as sources of pleasure, then we are identifying with the body, even if we can philosophically explain very nicely how I am not the body, I am the soul. So the soul's conception of happiness becomes equated with the gratification of the body's drives. However, there is a big difference. That although this, our soul is tied to our body like in all species, the soul wants more pleasure than what the body can provide. This is a key difference between humans and animals. Animals say all living beings eat food, but animals are satisfied with whatever food is provided by nature to them. A cow for millennia, generation after generation will keep eating the same grass. But we humans can, we humans want better food than what nature provides us. And that's why we just don't take what is in nature, we cook. And not only do we cook, we have hundreds of cuisines across the world. And each cuisine, there are hundreds and hundreds of items, delicacies. So the point here is that we humans, although we identify with the body's gratification as our source of pleasure, we want more than what the body provides. And that is why we try to increase bodily gratification. So that's why, uh, now this sometimes has unfortunate consequences. Generally, animals don't suffer because of obesity and a host of diseases that come up because of that. Because they eat when they are hungry and that's it. We humans eat even when we are not hungry. 
animals whenever the mating season comes up the urge comes within them they mate but we humans mate even when we have no urge to reproduce in fact much of modern society civilization modern society culture separates uh, uh, separates uh, physical union from physical reproduction and in fact there is a whole branch of science or a lot of scientific studies decide dedicated to how we can separate the two and i'll talk about this in a later session in much more detail the point here is that we want more pleasure than what the body can provide and that we seek it by say eating more than what the body can provide we seek it by mating more than what the body's imperative is for humans mating is not just a physical physical drive it's a psychological obsession constant psychological obsession so we want more pleasure than what the body can produce can pro provide or produce whichever you want to look at it so why is that indicates so that our longing for pleasure for more pleasure than what the body body provides this also differentiates us humans from animals that is also a symptom that our consciousness is more evolved and when we want more pleasure than what the body can provide then we will start thinking how will i get this more, more pleasure one way is of course by scientific advancement and technological advancement we try to create better arrangements for eating sleeping mating depending but the other could be by distancing ourselves from the body and realizing our soul so the evolved consciousness that we have is provided so that we can is provided to us so that we can we can inquire about spirituality mm -hmm. and we can grow spiritual <clears throat> i have mentioned briefly earlier the genesis account genesis is the first book of the bible the old testament about how god created all living beings and then he created man humans and then he was satisfied that the creation is complete now and there is a similar account in the 11th canto of the shrimad bhagavatam but with a significant twist so it is said that the supreme being created all living beings and then finally he created human beings and the bhagavatam says human beings had the capacity for philosophical inquiry for knowing the purpose of life and after creating humans uh, the creator was satisfied the lord was satisfied so what is the idea that the purpose of existence is to inquire about the purpose of existence first of all then of course later to fulfill the purpose of existence so only we humans can inquire about the purpose of existence and that's what differentiates us humans from animals so i'll speak one more concept and then i'll conclude this discussion so and what i'm trying to do now is the difference between humans and animals we are we are addressing that to answer the question are humans just evolved animals and we are, we look at the at the western understand contemporary understanding of the difference between humans and animals we look at the vedic understanding the gita understanding and now i'll try to integrate these two in terms of contemporary terms what does this difference mean so i use an acronym called skid s c i d for describing what differentiates humans and animals and this can be this can help us understand both in contemporary terms and also it can help us in our spiritual growth so there are four differentiations first is so that sorry that's a numbering mistake over here sorry about that self awareness conscience imagination and determination i changed that but didn't get saved sorry about that so self awareness oh 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 i think i'm not sharing the screen mm -hmm. so this is i hope the previous screen was shared so yeah self awareness conscience imagination and it is determination not will power i'll explain this so so self awareness that means the question what am i doing what am i doing what am i feeling we can become aware of our urges so among all living beings we have a capacity to abstract ourselves from our body and look at ourselves and consider what are we doing so for example if i'm sitting here right now i can ask i can visualize maybe i am at the ceiling i am looking at this looking at myself what is this fellow doing i can observe, we can in a sense abstract ourselves and 
we can <clears throat> we can abstract ourselves and we can become aware of ourselves we can become aware of our emotions we can do introspection what am i doing what am i feeling so then that's self awareness and then from this comes conscience conscience is oh am i doing the right thing sometimes for example we may do something wrong and then we may feel hey i shouldn't have done this i shouldn't have spoken like this i shouldn't have done that so self awareness is first of all we can become aware not just of our actions but also of our emotions our in emotions our intentions our thoughts and then conscience is also not just awareness of right or wrong but also is effective not e double f e c t i v but a double f e c t i v effective means related with emotions conscience gives us a effective response we feel emotion hey, that was not i we feel bad about it then there is imagination imagination means we can visualize hey i was acting like that but i can act like this and then that capacity now if we can then i'll list this and then i'll explain this more then there is determination determination is that we can choose to act in a particular way like i earlier said animals can't really restrain their uh, bodily urges by conscious intention by circumstances they may fast because there's no water or food available but they don't really uh make a conscious resolve to restrain their urges for some higher purpose but we human beings can do that so self awareness that's understanding our emotions conscience is a sensation of right and wrong now, animals don't usually get that sense they just live and they just do what their bodily urges urge them to do then there is imagination imagination is a huge differentiator now even if something is not existing we can just see a pile of concrete and we can visualize i want a house like this now animals also can create nests and other things but more or less uh, birds create the same nest it might be phenomenally uh, brilliant but it's more of the same constructed generation after generation after generation and then this imagination so our art our music all this is a product of our imagination and then there is determination that is we can commit ourselves that i will put aside my urges and act and in fact when we talk about dharma it is not just going to a temple and doing some religious ritual or going to a church and doing a religious ritual mm, so what we understand is that there is a difference and this difference can be analyzed in these terms so now for our spiritual life we have to have self awareness what kind of urges do i have what kind of i desires do i have Uh, we can make sense that i have some impure desires only when we have some kind of uh, self awareness and then we all have a sense of conscience oh and our spiritual growth means to sharpen our conscience so oh, i should not be doing this i should be doing this and then imagination our imagination is sparked by hearing spiritual texts and by hearing about the spiritual experiences that great spiritualists have had how they have access to far greater joys than what we have and then that is meant to lead to determination that we may withhold certain physical pleasures so that we can have we can progress towards a spiritual treasure so that we can get spiritual realization and that's how we all can progress in our lives in our spiritual life also so i'll summarize what i spoke today i spoke broadly on the theme of how our what are humans just do animals have souls and are humans just evolved animals so we discussed this how can we know if someone has a soul or not two characteristics got presence of consciousness which we can see in one way through the presence of emotions and animals do have emotions and second is the difference between um between matter that doesn't have consciousness and matter that has consciousness normal matter this is creation deterioration destruction ensouled matter we can have a embodied soul and a ensouled matter ensouled matter means matter where soul is present there is there is birth there is uh, growth maintenance reproduction then then aging and destruct death so these three differentiations are there between humans and between living and non living beings 
and that is also an indicator of the presence of the soul so animals do have souls now why the idea that animals don't have souls that comes from broadly the christian tradition which has says that only humans can be delivered and only humans have souls and that so the all of the word soul is used similarly in christianity and the vedic tradition the big difference that the idea the soul is that the soul can't exist separate from the body and the soul is created at birth and is eternal thereafter that's the difference i talked about the uh, pendulum so christianity holds that only humans uh, only have souls or at least the souls that can attain eternal life and evolutionary theory holds that no one has souls there's nothing the humans are entire special in category and there is no speciality among human beings in terms of spirit, spirituality but the gita's understanding is Yes, there is something special about human beings, but the difference is in category. Is not in category; it is in degree. The soul is more evolved in human beings, and what does that evolved soul mean? We try to understand from from various perspectives. So, is it our capacity to gain knowledge, our reasoning faculty, our moral sense, our <clears throat> our capacity for willpower and determination? Is all these, but it is more. We have to go fundamentally. Talk about the what the Bhag the Mahabharat says it is dharma. <coughs> so dharma is basically uh, not just religious activity, but the capacity for philosophical inquiry followed by purposeful religious activity. The, uh, we discussed that humans, all the living beings, fulfill their bodily drives. And to identify with the body means to think that the body's gratification is our pleasure, and that's all is our pleasure. but humans want more pleasure than what the body can provide and that is how we grow that is how we uh, we do art we do science we do language and ultimately that's how we grow spiritually we want more than what the body itself can provide so i talked about uh, the difference integrating the dharmic perspective and the contemporary perspective that in terms of skid so self awareness conscience imagination and determination and these four need to be utilized systematically for our spiritual growth also so thank you very much for your attention we'll see how many questions we can answer now okay that's a good question mm -hmm. so can we really say that human beings have the most evolved souls is it that the soul takes the simply the characteristic of the body that the soul in the human body is is uh, behaving in a particular way because the body has certain endowments and the same soul may go into an animal body and then uh, maybe if it goes in tiger body it will start eating flesh so is it the difference of the soul or is it just difference of the body that it has uh, it's neither this nor it's not this or that it's this and that okay so certainly the human body is different from the animal body and say for example we see the human brain is much much more developed than animal brains and does if we consider language or art or whatever all this we if the soul has to do something it has to have the physical instrument to do it without which it cannot do it so uh, but at the same time the physical instrument alone doesn't do things the soul also has to have the desire to do those things the intention to do those things so both come together the soul's na uh, the soul's consciousness also changes uh, baldev vidya bhushan in his vedanta sutra commentary talks about two terms gyana rupa and gyana swarupa so there are um, so he is basically analyzing the upanishads and he's the vedanta sutra essentially is a reconcile conciliation of various statements uh, in the upanishads so one statement is the soul never changes and the other are the statements also which talk about how the consciousness changes so what he says is 
the soul itself doesn't change but the soul's consciousness changes and when the soul comes to the human body the consciousness itself is more evolved in the sense that the consciousness is eager for more inquiry and that's why we say that say for example if the pair, if, if the a couple is uniting and if the, the the couple is also spiritually evolved and they have spiritually inclined consciousness then they will attract a soul of a similar nature and <clears throat> so the idea here is that the soul's consciousness is evolved and the body is also uh, more sophisticated for the soul to give the for the soul to function uh, according to its more evolved consciousness if it's only due to the body if it were only due to the body then why is it that even in the human body we can see there are some soul some people who live according to very evolved consci- evolved ways and others who live very materialistically almost animalistically now is it simply because of upbringing sometimes same parents may have some one child who is very spiritual one who is very materialistic sometimes it might happen even among twins and even among identical twins so all material factors are same among them that the the upbringing is the same the genes are the same then but they are radically different why that so now you could say that the soul is completely unaffected and it is the mind and the, the you remember we discussed earlier the soul mind and body so we could say the impressions in the mind are what she, we carry from one life to another and that's true but right now we are talking about from the perspective that the soul functioning in the material world is the soul and the mind combined together the soul itself is uh, it's not even perceivable for us so that way if you want to say then the soul is completely unaffected by anything material but that utterly unaffected soul is not even perceivable or accessible for us so for us when we talk about what we are talking about is is there something non physical that is different from the that is that is different in different species the physicality is different of course animals and humans have different bodies but the non physical component is also different so in the non physical there can be the mind and the body mind and the soul and for all practical purposes the soul and the mind are very tightly tied together as one unit and based on the kind of way a soul lives in a particular body the impressions are formed and soul carries those impressions so when we say the soul is more evolved that means the impressions in the mind which surrounds the soul in the subtle body basically they are more receptive uh, or they are more they are they are capable of being a better channel for spiritual inquiry so in that sense the consciousness is more evolved then okay now cats and e- cats and dogs they eat for they also become obese so do they eat only by instinct do they not eat for pleasure well again it is not a matter of black and white the point here is that cats and dogs do not really go about making cuisines so yes animals also eat more sometimes and especially we could say when the animals are contaminated by human association animals don't smoke or smoke but there are cats and dogs who smoke if they are associating with humans who are smoking and humans teach them to do that the point here is that we humans have a higher intelligence by which we try to do these activities more than what is naturally possible for us now animals if they are living in a flourishing area their bodies will be bodies will be well built you could say that they are eating more than what is necessary if they are living in a famine struck area they might be the bodies might be shrunk and as far as pleasure is concerned it's not that instinct and pleasure are separated instinct and pleasure are linked together when when anybody eats when, say for example mating there is a biological instinct but nature has arranged for that biological instinct to also have pleasure with it so it's not that they eat only for instinct and not for pleasure but the point is that we make humans make much much more arrangements for eating because we are not satisfied with the pleasure that is available simply from the biological activity of eating as per our instincts so and we try to make various arrangements for getting that pleasure okay now 
-hmm. Okay, we cannot understand. So we cannot understand the animals' languages. So how can we know not? How can we know that they are not making conscious choices and decisions? Well, <clears throat> we have to have certain basics clear by which we can move forward in any discussion now are we looking at things from a contemporary rational perspective and approaching the Dhar vedic perspective or are we looking at it from the vedic perspective be very clear so the way we are approaching in this discussion is we are looking from a contemporary rational perspective and then moving to a scriptural perspective so from the contemporary perspective animals don't have languages Animals only utter guttural sounds of different kinds uh, that can be very sophisticated systems. So a bird uh, can, can chirp in a per different ways to convey uh, different things. And within that also they can be sophisticated. But as I said, language has a lot of things. So animals, even in animals, there is no evidence that they write anything at all. So I said language has three aspects to it. First of all is certain verbal sounds that convey certain things, then those are also so the verbal sounds, the associated with abstract conceptions, not just physical objects. And then there is the physical depiction, the script writing. So all this the animals don't have. Is it simply that, uh, as I said, if we say animals don't, we don't understand animals languages, that's fine, but we can look at their activities and ethologists have been studying, ethologists are those who study animals or living beings in their natural habitat. They have been studying uh, animals for, for centuries now. And there is no evidence that animals have anywhere near the sophisticated system of communication that we humans call as language. So it's not just a matter of now whether animals have consciousness or animals have sophisticated consciousness, whether they're thinking deeply and making decisions. That's entirely different. That's how can we ever know? The only thing we can know is by looking at the uh, evidence. Now, when in sometimes within now going to the other perspective within tradition, we might see something like talking animals, but then they're not just ordinary. So in the Rama and when there are monkeys which are talking, they're not ordinary monkeys, they're Vanaras. And in the cosmic hierarchy, Vanaras are considered actually in some ways higher than humans also, some ways, not always. So it's not just ordinary monkeys, although sometimes it may be presented that way. It's a different species. It's not equivalent to the species which you talk about. So animals have systems of communication, but they don't have anywhere near the sophisticated system of communication that we humans call as language. <clears throat> and what level of thinking they can do that we infer from their activities. And those activities, as far as we observe, we don't see them doing any of the activities that characterize humans in terms of advanced consciousness. So now is a soul present in everything? Now the Padma Puran clearly talks about which are all the areas in which the soul wanders. And within that, it is said that the soul wanders through various species, rising from the aquatics to the various species. So it doesn't talk about stones having soul, souls. Now there might be some exceptions where some souls may have uh, some stones might have some souls within them. Now, as far as spirit being present everywhere, that is a theory called, a philosophical school called panpsychism, where consciousness is present in all of existence. We accept that to some extent because the super soul, God is present everywhere. But is consciousness itself present everywhere? <clears throat> yeah, uh, we don't know. There is no evidence, sorry. Is consciousness present in plants and in, in stones and other things? in terms of individual souls being present and the stone being the body for the soul, there is no evidence for that. And stones don't generally exhibit the other three symptoms of reproduction and things like that. So we could say that there could be some exceptions where some, in some cases some souls might be present, but it's not that every, every rock or every stone or every pebble is a body for a particular soul. Now what about Chaitanya Mahaprabhu making animals dance and speak and sing the holy names? Well, they sang the holy name, whether they spoke is open to question. And especially when God is present, then it's entirely different. What is done by God is miraculous. 
that is not the norm so krishna lifted govardhan hill that doesn't mean that uh, every hill can be lifted by everyone so we are discussing about the norms and animals have lower consciousness humans have more evolved consciousness okay mm, okay so now does this argument that animals have consciousness your oysters not have oysters not have a higher brain and they don't have mm, that's fine the important thing is we need to recognize two different things over there that the soul's consciousness will be exhibited according to the body's development also and if the body is not developed in a particular way that soul's consciousness will not be developed so now we could do a exhaustive study and analyze whether okay what are the symptoms of consciousness in this particular body or that particular bo body but we are talking about a general principle that how can we infer that consciousness is present so emotions presence of emotions is just one symptom of consciousness not the sole symptom and not necessarily a decisive symptom also okay i'll take um, i'll take um, a few questions and we'll stop in and remaining questions i'll answer later so uh, dogs can take part in chanting as shila prabhupa said that's fine but are they doing it intentionally anybody can do that anybody can take part in chanting but is it by conscious choice of free will is it that they are gratif delaying the gratification of their urges not necessarily and are we having uh, i apes and monkeys are actually lower level human beings that's fine that's fine apes and monkeys are we could say the closest to us and uh, biologically their body is quite similar to us and significantly different also in terms of the sophistication of the brain but um, uh, there we can always have certain border cases which we need to analyze specifically so border cases means like if i say india and pakistan now we have the broad sense of india and pakistan but if we go to the border where is the exact line that has to be carefully decided uh, we'll have to so similarly you know, where exactly does the human species end and where does the animal species apes or monkeys begin begin uh, with with the tigers or plants we can very easily differentiate but if there is some biological similarity then where exactly is the difference there is a fine line which will have to be studied specifically and then decided no last question uh, which we shall conclude now so is um, okay is learning a sign of growth so if robots also learn then what about that well learning is a sign of growth but what we are talking about is categorically different over here robots they learn but they don't they don't understand that they are learning they are just simply programmed and that's how uh, they do something uh, we may have a separate session when we talk about science and spirituality that we'll be talking about in the seventh chapter at that time we'll talk more about ai and uh, what differentiates um, what are the characteristic of spirituality and science and various uh, border cases we'll discuss but broadly speaking no matter how sophisticated a computer or a robot or any other device becomes essentially it is simply doing number crunching it is simply doing a alteration of 01010101010101 and that alteration is not different from much different in essence not in functionality in essence if we have in traditionally there was a abacus which was used for mathematical calculation so many of you know about us you just pull 1 2 3 4 5 6 down and then you count now we could make an abacus which would be as big as a palace and which can have many knobs and we could have different people moving it down fast very fast but we wouldn't say that abacus has become conscious it's just it's a physical structure and it just beads being moved down on the abacus so similarly no matter how sophisticated a computer becomes essentially it is doing nothing but number crunching there are three differences between say normal number crunching and what a computer does 
it is extremely fast second it is done according to certain codes and patterns but those codes and patterns are also numbers and third is that this is done in such a way that it can simulate human actions but simulation is not the original there's a categorical difference so animals do the activities that simul simulate human activities but they don't experience anything at all so in that sense the learning in machines is very different from the learning in humans so gary kasparov was defeated by gary, the chess champion gary kasparov was defeated by deep blue a computer in a chess match now kasparov was devastated now the computer didn't even understand it at one a match the computer just functioned according to some programming the makers of deep blue were delighted but deep blue itself there's no emotion at all there's no experience so it plays without knowing it is playing it learns without knowing that it is learning so that's there's a categorical difference between consciousness among conscious beings and the simulations of some of the activities of conscious beings done by machines so thank you very much if there are any remaining questions uh, we will answer them by uh, by audio podcast later and yes you can post questions here or you can post questions in our whatsapp group and um, we will uh, we'll try to answer them soon thank you very much hare krishna